General Michael Flynn could be termed a partial friendly. Uh, he does not want to perpetuate eternal warfare, as far as I can tell, uh, but he is a soldier ready to battle Islam as he perceives it, which is not exactly good. He doesn't uh, uh, want to battle Islam as a religion. He wants to battle Islamism, but he has trouble making very clear exactly uh, that distinction, but it's obvious to anyone. If you're not up in arms trying to uh, uh, engage in hostilities in the United States and get past that point, he will lay down his arms as well. Um, now, the next fellow to look at is this Peter Thiel. Peter, Peter Thiel uh, pledged his support. He was the only Silicon Valley uh, billionaire type to do so. Comes out of PayPal. Uh, he's uh, openly gay and he's in the transition team. There's another reason to pray of something other than the most horrid outcome uh, with a mix of political powers in Washington with this new wrench of the Trump administration. So Peter Thiel, possible, friendly. Thank you very much for having me here. Everybody knows we've been living through a crazy election year. Real events seem like the rehearsals for Saturday Night Live. Only an outbreak of insanity would seem to account for the unprecedented fact that this year, a political outsider managed to win a major party nomination. To the people who are used to influencing our choice of leaders, to the wealthy people who give money and the commentators who give reasons why, it all seems like a bad dream. Donors don't want to find out how and why we got here. They just want to move on. Come November 9th, they hope everyone else will go back to business as usual. But it is just this heedlessness, this temptation to ignore difficult realities indulged in by our most influential citizens that got us where we are today. A lot of successful people are too proud to admit it, since it seems to put their success in question. But the truth is, no matter how crazy this election seems, it is less crazy than the condition of our country. Especially when this is the only country where you have to pay up to 10 times as much for simple medicines as you would pay anywhere else. America's overpriced health care system might help subsidize the rest of the world, but that doesn't help the Americans who can't afford it, and they've started to notice. Our youngest citizens may not have huge medical bills, but their college tuition keeps on increasing faster than the rate of inflation, adding more every year to our $1.3 trillion mountain of student debt. Our youngest citizens may not have huge medical bills, but their college tuition keeps on increasing faster than the rate of inflation, adding more every year to our $1.3 trillion mountain of student debt. America has become the only country where students take on loans they can never escape, not even by declaring bankruptcy. Stuck in this broken system, millennials are the first generation who expect their own lives to be worse and the lives of their parents. While American families' expenses have been increasing relentlessly, their incomes have been stagnant. In real dollars, the median household makes less money today than it made 17 years ago. Nearly half of Americans wouldn't be able to come up with $400 if they needed it for an emergency. Yet while households struggle to keep up with the challenges of everyday life, the government is wasting trillions of dollars of taxpayer money on faraway wars. Right now, we're fighting five of them. In Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, and Somalia. Now, not everyone is hurting. In the wealthy suburbs that ring Washington, D.C., people are doing just fine. Where I work in Silicon Valley, people are doing just great. But most Americans don't live by the Beltway or the San Francisco Bay. Most Americans haven't been part of that prosperity. It shouldn't be surprising to see people vote for Bernie Sanders or for Donald Trump, who is the only outsider left in the race. Advancing a bit. Why would they think that Trump, 
of all people could make it any better. I think it's because of the big things that Trump gets right. For example, free trade has not worked out well for all of America. It helps that Trump, um, it helps Trump that the other side just doesn't get it. All of our elites preach free trade. The highly educated people who make public policy explain that cheap imports make everyone a winner, according to economic theory. But in actual practice, we've lost tens of thousands of factories and millions of jobs to foreign trade. The heartland has been devastated. Or maybe they don't worry about it too much because they think they're among the winners. The sheer size of the U.S. trade deficit shows that something has gone badly wrong. The most developed country in the world should be exporting capital to less developed countries. Instead, the United States is importing more than $500 billion every year. That money flows into financial assets. It distorts our economy in favor of more banking and more financialization. And it gives the well-connected people who benefit a reason to defend the status quo. But well, for me, that's quite important. He talks about financialization because a big part, whether you believe in a communitarian utopia where we've eliminated work, we've been able to automate all of our utilities so we can get what we need by silent robots running under the hood, one extreme to another of a sort of a capitalist utopia of just uh, everyone offering services in a uh, uh, well uh, lit place for businesses. It's agreed by even people like Peter Thiel uh, that non productive uh, rent seeking layers in the economy can asphyxiate creativity. But not everyone benefits, and the Trump voters know it. I think Trump voters are also tired of war. We have been at war for 15 years, and we have spent more than $4.6 trillion. More than 2 million people have lost their lives, and more than 5,000 American soldiers have been killed. But we haven't won. The Bush administration promised that $50 billion could bring democracy to Iraq. Instead, we've squandered 40 times as much to bring about chaos. Yet even after these bipartisan failures, the Democratic Party is more hawkish today than at any time since it began the war in Vietnam. Harking back to the no-fly zone that Bill Clinton enforced uh, over Iraq before Bush's failed war, now Hillary Clinton has called for a no-fly zone over Syria. Incredibly, that would be a mistake even more reckless than invading Iraq. Since most of the planes flying over Syria today are Russian planes, action would do worse than involve us in a messy civil war. It would risk a direct nuclear conflict. Nuclear conflict. What explains this eagerness to escalate a dangerous situation? How can Hillary Clinton be so wildly over-optimistic about the outcome of war? I would suggest that it comes from a lot of practice. For a long time, our elites have been in the habit of denying difficult realities. That's how bubbles form. Whenever there is a hard problem, but people want to believe in an easy solution, they will be tempted to deny reality and inflate a bubble. Something about the experience of the baby boomers, whose lives have been so much easier than their parents or their children's, has led them to buy into bubbles again and again. The trade bubble says everyone's a winner. The war bubble says victory is just around the corner. But these over-optimistic stories simply haven't been true, and voters are tired of being lied to. It was both insane and somehow inevitable that DC insiders expected this election to be a rerun between the two political dynasties who led us through the two most gigantic financial bubbles of our time. President George W. Bush presided over the inflation of a housing bubble so big that its collapse is still causing economic stagnation today. 
But what's strangely forgotten is that last decade's housing bubble was just an attempt to make up for the gains that had been lost in the decade before that. In the 1990s, President Bill Clinton presided over an enormous stock market bubble and a devastating crash in 2000, just as his second term was coming to an end. And you know, it's funny, I hadn't thought about all the people who were wiped out in 2000 here in the Silicon Valley. There was a, it was like a gold rush around here but many people were absolutely bankrupted by overspending and taxes on a high flight life that suddenly seized to a halt. Uh, my own mother lost all the money that she had in her 401k. Just as his second term was coming to an end. That's how long the same people have been pursuing the same disastrous policies. Now that someone different is in the running, someone who rejects the false reassuring stories that tell us everything is fine. His Now that someone different is in the running, someone who rejects the false reassuring stories that tell us everything is fine, his larger-than-life persona attracts a lot of attention. Nobody would suggest that Donald Trump is a humble man. But the big things he's right about amount to a much needed dose of humility in our politics. Very unusually for a presidential candidate, he has questioned the core concept of American exceptionalism. He doesn't think the force of optimism alone can change reality without hard work. Just as much as it's about making him humility in our politics. Very unusually for a presidential candidate, he has questioned the core concept of American exceptionalism. He doesn't think the force of optimism alone can change reality without hard work. Just as much as it's about making America great, Trump's agenda is about making America a normal country. A normal country doesn't have a half trillion dollar trade deficit. A normal country doesn't fight five simultaneous undeclared wars. In a normal country, the government actually does its job. And today it's important to recognize that the government has a job to do. Voters are tired of hearing conservative politicians say that government never works. They know the government wasn't always this broken. The Manhattan Project, the interstate highway system, the Apollo program, Whatever you think of these ventures, you cannot doubt the competence of the government that got them done. But we have fallen very far from that standard. We cannot let free market ideology serve as an excuse for decline. It's not going away. He points toward a new Republican Party beyond the dogmas of Reaganism. He points even beyond the remaking of one party to a new American politics that overcomes denial, rejects bubble thinking, and reckons with reality. Now, uh, Christie, who has fallen a bit, uh, Giuliani, uh, these are not people that, uh, I'm looking into people that I'm the least uh, traumatized to have to deal with. So Peter Thiel, I haven't typed him officially here, he's in this upper list here, but I'll go ahead and enter him into the Hall of Fame here of people that we hope will be anti-establishment. Um, so, here it goes. So, the people in the progressive movement that are allied with uh, the good cause, the cause of uh, uh, empowering citizens again, the middle class, uh, the working people, uh, and not allowing uh, a sense of alienation is set in where we feel that uh, more and more of our society is uh, controlled by uh, elites, frankly. Um, so uh, one issue is what sort of cross uh, right left alliance can be formed on issues of uh, trade infrastructure. How do we align a solid wall on issues of persecution of immigrants, 
uh, by holding the line perhaps on just the felons and gang members, maybe we could target that. I don't like to target any group for victimization, but uh, the people, I haven't looked into this, and um, uh, you probably could target a certain population to remove uh, based on crime, but I'm very concerned with all the people that are fearful of deportation right now, the, the fear that's in the country, and that leads me to the other aspect of this, which is if uh, a clear policy about ultranationalism is not articulated by Trump, there will be an ultranationalist wave that will sweep through Europe. And the last time this happened, things did not end up well. We ended up with a wave of fascism. And this is not to be laughed at. <clears throat> um, and uh, John Germany was on a CNN talking about all of the uh, reports he's getting about kids imitating uh, racist and misogynistic behaviors. So this could just be uh, certain people uh, amplifying things that normally occur and now it's being contrasted with Trump. I don't know what the rate of kids that are bullied for misogyny uh, and racism is on a daily rate and if there's a spike or not or whether it's anecdotally driven by sensitivity. I don't know and I'm not suggesting anything. Let, we'll take it on his face and say, let's say they have gone up. So there should be some uh, address of this and some concern about letting the genie out of the bottle. That if we upset the ap apple cart of this uh, Washington elite, uh, of foreign uh, policy elite, and we accidentally trigger the world where China and Russia and the U.S. and Europe uh, were more and more ignoring uh, human rights. Uh, right now we have a uh, hypocrisy. We claim to defend human rights. We use an excuse to invade and make places infinitely more miserable. In every case, without exception, over 50 or 60 interventions, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Indonesia, Chile, the, coup, the military coups in Brazil, the assassination of Patrice Lumumba in the Congo, Zaire, uh, you know, uh, Mossadegh in Iran. Uh, without exception, these all led to bad uh, consequences. Uh, you know, some could argue that the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union uh, was a goodness, uh, but uh, uh, so, but, but there was a that was not a military intervention by the U.S. Uh, wasn't even an assassination, although there was a tremendous amount of pressure exerted. So, ultranationalism has an ugly history in Europe, associated with the fascism. Uh, and uh, it is a genie, uh, and I will hold Trump accountable if he cannot figure out what to do with this energy that he's potentially triggering that may go too far to the right, may destabilize Western civilization. Uh, so on the subject of <clears throat> the incoming cabinet, we have the usual gang of suspects, the Washington elite, the conservative flavor of it, Gianni, Christie. Uh, then we've got Steve Bannon from uh, Breitbart, who hates the elite, has been destructive even to the Republican Party elite. He's a bomb thrower. I don't know everything about him yet. And then there's Peter, Peter Thiel, who's made some very interesting analyses and is probably the most hopeful of this uh, group. Uh, so I hope I was of use to you. Uh, there's still a chance that uh, the voters, by electing Trump, may have triggered certain positive uh, changes, as well as some terrible negative ones we're going to have to brace for, such as uh, environmental in particular. My name is Alexander Hagan. Good night and good luck.